And if you could only do one thing, it would be water. Everybody needs water. Um, and they, and of course, they need some food. I find that suet is the uh, second most popular thing in my backyard. But behind water, it, I get more species that come to suet. Um, birds, of course, take care of their own clothing. But you can add little shelter items in, in your yard. You can put out piles of Christmas trees or leave a pile of wood, and you'll get some animals and birds to use it. <clears throat> um, if you do use water, just consider that we have, you know, a mosquito problem. We have the uh, Asian tiger mosquitoes here, and they're prolific breeders. Uh, you can use these mosquito dunks that are, it's not a pesticide, it's not a chemical. Um, I usually don't recommend the mosquito fish because it's not native, um, although people do use it. Otherwise, I just, I, I have little water elements around. I just change the water every few days in the spring and summer to keep mosquitoes from uh, breeding too much. Um, one of the things that we have, one of the groups of birds that we see in our urban areas a lot are, are cavity nesters. And so many of you may provide some cavities for birds. You might you'd be familiar with bluebird, for example. A lot of people like to put out a bluebird house, but a lot of other birds will use that house. And so I'm going to talk about some of these, not all of them. But it's interesting to see that nearly 20 species of birds, for example, here in Wake County are cavity nesters. <clears throat> And I'm going to cover things that you may not have heard about. So by that, um, probably not going to be the real common birds uh, so much. Some of them will be, but you know probably a lot about hummingbird, bluebird, cardinal. A lot of that is online, and uh, you hear it from other folks. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to showcase some things you might not have realized are just right here in your front or backyard. And, you know, there's only so much time. So, <clears throat> um, But here's my obligatory uh, bluebird shot. I'm going to start with some raptors. And so in, uh, in Wake County, for example, across the Piedmont, we got this variety of species. I can't talk about them all, but let's pick a few and look at what we might see even in a downtown area on your, uh, in your screen is a flying, it's an osprey or what we used to call fish hawk, um, sometimes confused with bald eagles. But osprey was like the bald eagle, nearly wiped out years ago. but um, it's back, and we see them in some of our larger bodies of water around the Piedmont. Vultures, they don't get a lot of respect, but I love uh, seeing them. I love talking about them. I've done programs entirely on vultures. There are 16 species in what we call the old world across the big pond. And then in the new world in North and South America, we have five species of vultures and two species of condors. So we'll just look at the ones for North Carolina. We have two in North Carolina. And out west, of course, you've probably heard of the California condor endangered species, and <clears throat> it's made a good comeback with some captive breeding. But we'll take a look here on the in the middle of the turkey vulture with the red head. The adults have the red head, and the black vulture has the black head. Look at some of the uh, just differences about them. The turkey vulture is a little more cold tolerant. You can see on the range map during the breeding season, it occurs further further north. We'll compare it with the black vulture, and it's uh, the blacks don't get quite that far, and it's found all the way to the tip of South America. It's a migratory species, and I'll show you a, a map where uh, some of the flight paths that a couple birds took that were tracked. They're common in most places, more common than they used to be, I would say, thanks to Henry Ford and um, all the other automobiles that are now around. <clears throat> and, you know, they're, they're doing the job that few, uh, few of us want to do. It's like that one on your right. He's cleaning up a squirrel that was hit by a car and then died on this. Actually, I think it died in the road and he pulled it over to the sidewalk in front of my neighbor's house. They can be confused with an immature eagle. These are all turkey vultures, but bald eagle immatures are, are pretty dark, are dark brown when they're young the first couple of years. Um, but the turkey vultures have this bicolored pattern to the wing that bald eagles do not have it. They're more uh, uniform or mottled underneath. <clears throat> and turkey vultures, when they're flying and soaring, their wings are in kind of a V-shape. This one's hard to see, but it's actually the tips are elevated. So it's kind of bent at the right here at the shoulder, bends it back. And if you get a good look, like in the sunlight here, you see the redhead on this guy and the redhead on this one perched. The tail sticks out and the head is, is kind of a short neck. And we'll, talk, we'll look at an eagle in flight here in a second. They look different in flight. But first, here's a black vulture in flight and perched. Their flight pattern is a little different because they're very short tail compared to the turkey vulture. You can see on the map, they don't occur as far north as the turkey vulture there. Uh, and they don't really migrate that we know of. They just, where they are, they are all year round and throughout 
uh, Central and South America, <clears throat> where I've worked in in both. I've worked in ten different countries in Central and South America, and down there the black vulture is extremely urbanized bird. It's all over the sides of roads in cities. It's sort of like a pigeon, the way we see pigeons here. But that hasn't happened here in this country yet. We don't see them so urbanized in the U.S. I expect someday they they very well will be. But for now, when we do see them in a setting, sort of a, in, around people like this on buildings or uh, power uh, the poles, power poles and uh, rooftops, both turkey and black vultures will get in some pretty big groups and they can be a real problem because when they have, when you have 40 vultures and they're all defecating, it's a real mess. And one of the other problems is turkey vultures like this one here, they are attracted to, you know, rotting flesh. And when you have a new roof or a car in the sun where the rubber gasket around your windshield is off gassing, that it's those products are made with petroleum byproducts and the, there's a chemical that's very much like rotting flesh. So we get calls, um, seems like one a year where somebody's got a turkey vulture ripping up their new roof. It's because the new shingles are are in the sun and they're giving off this aroma and the vulture is confused. It thinks that there's a dead animal there. Um, so the turkey vulture is a very efficient glider, very efficient flyer. The black vultures are less so. They have a higher wing loading. You'll see them flap more. The turkey vulture is the one with the great sense of smell to rotting flesh. <clears throat> the black vulture does not smell. It will locate food by eyesight or by watching turkey vultures. You'll typically see, if you see a dead deer on the road, uh, you'll find it that black vultures find that pretty quickly. You'll come back and find a little flock of five or 10 black vultures around. They can locate larger items like a dead deer very quickly. They have very good eyesight. And here's a couple maps. It's interesting. There's a site called MoveBank. Anybody can go and you can explore what other researchers have placed on this website. It's all kinds of animals now, people tracking animals all over the world. And this site was set up for uh, people like me. I do some of this work and we can we can put our data here and other people can look at it. And I just went out and grabbed a couple maps of vultures. Here's some from Saskatchewan that were tracked. These were satellite tracks. So the, the transmitter was sending a signal to the satellites while these birds were migrating south-south down to Colombia and Venezuela. Here's another couple of birds that were in southern New York and went to South Florida. And here on the right is just a zoomed in shot of those birds. You can see that they departed and flew right over North Carolina and wound their way down into South Florida. It's kind of interesting to see. Um, now we, we have this ability to do all kinds of work like this with different sized animals. Uh, bald eagles now are all around the Piedmont. In fact, they're in a lot of, in the coastal plain too, all over North Carolina. It's been a great conservation success story. Uh, you know, they were nearly <clears throat> wiped out from DDT, but we, folks have done a great job bringing them back. So all of our large lakes around here, Jordan Lake, Falls, even the medium lakes like Lake Wheeler, Lake Raleigh, Lake Johnson, you can go and find eagles. And in many places now, um, and even in these medium lakes, their pairs have established and set up a nest. They're trying to raise a family. So these are adult plumage birds. The young do not have the white head and tail until they get in their fourth or fifth year. The thing I was saying before about notice how in the vulture, they really don't have much of a neck, so they don't look like they have much of a head sticking out. When you see an eagle flying over, the head and this bill really stick out, even on a young one. So even if it's a dark tail and a dark head, it really puts the wings kind of in the uh, central part of the bird. So its flight shape looks different. Stepping down to some smaller hawks, one of the most common hawks around is the red-tailed hawk. It's common in urban areas, it's common in farm country, it's common in a lot of country songs too. <clears throat> um, people love red-tailed hawks. Um, the tail isn't quite red, I'll show you some pictures in a second. And it takes a couple of years for the young to acquire the adult plumage. So here's a young bird. It's got a brownish tail, medium brown with darker brown bands. But one thing red tails always have, especially in the east, they have this white chest and then they have a spots on the belly band. So here I've shown a couple of pictures from far away and one not quite in focus just to show you that it doesn't have to be a perfect view and you can still see the white chest. You can see the belly band here and you know it's got to be a red tailed hawk. You can even see the light coming through on both of these birds. It's just sort of this orangey brown coloration, that's where it gets its name. These are these are adult red-tailed hawks. And we can look at a bird from above, this one on the right, this is where it gets the name. It's really an orangey brown coloration. 
Um, these are a couple of birds that uh, for years, for about four years, there was a pair nesting downtown by the Capitol across the street on the on the big church. And we, we tracked them for several years. And there was this fella, uh, Jordan. He took a, thousands of photos and put them on his website. I've created a couple of pages at the end, some resources, and uh, I sent a PDF to uh, Jessica. She can uh, post it to folks if you want, just like resources like this, places to go and look up things like all the photos that Jordan took over the years, not just red tails, but the other hawks and things that he saw flying around down there. Um, so here's another one related to red tail. They're a little bit smaller. They're called red shouldered hawk. They get the name from this little area in their wing here. Again, it's not really red, <clears throat> but um, there it is. And this is an adult, uh, a couple of different adults that were uh, in our neighborhood for a while, I live in West Raleigh near Powell Community Park and right off the belt line. These guys used to nest around our lake. Now they've moved over. I hear them a, a half a mile away calling at times, but they like the wetter areas. They're, they're specialized on snakes and other reptiles and amphibians when they feed. So that, that, ten, that then they wanna be around wetter areas where they're gonna find prey items like, like that. But they're pretty common in our urban areas. And here's a bird that um, just a half a mile away where uh, my assistant at the museum, the other ornithologist where he lives, he was out working in his backyard one day and this red shoulder flew down and grabbed this garter snake right in front of him. And his wife, who's a photographer, ran in and got her camera and got this great picture. It's a beautiful bird, the adults. You can see it black and white in the wing and the tail and this rather, uh, the sort of rufous or chestnut color underneath. Now, when, the, when these hawks are young, uh, as I said, it takes them a couple of years to get the adult plumage. And when they're young, uh, several of these species look alike and it makes it a little confusing. And I'm not gonna like tell all the details of how to tell them apart. I mean, there are, there are these resources that, that I mentioned at the end, you can look that up or get some books or join our Audubon Club and learn more. But I just wanted to show you what happens. Here's an immature red-shouldered hawk. Over here is an immature Cooper's hawk. And they can look pretty similar, especially if you only get a, a quick glance. Uh, the young hawks tend to be the streaked underneath and the adults tend to be more barred with some streaking and are usually more colorful. So, okay, this is a red shoulder and those are the two uh, sort of larger hawks. And now look at a couple smaller ones and look, look at that Cooper's hawk again. This is the immature. This is what the adults look like. And more of a slaty gray on the back. And again, they have, also have like that orangey brown underneath like the uh, red shouldered hawk have, but they're not really related at all to red shoulders. And in fact, uh, these birds specialize on eating other smaller birds. <clears throat> so a lot of bird watchers get a little anxious when they see these guys flying around. Um, female raptors, by the way, are larger than their um, mates, than their males. And in this case, I happen to know this is a larger individual bird with a female, and, and this was a smaller male that I photographed down near, uh, <clears throat> down near Walnut Creek, actually with the Biltmore Hills uh, Park, City Park. So here's another bird, a female Cooper's hawk in my backyard a few years ago, sitting on, no surprise, on a bird feeder because that's what they do. They eat small birds. So the Cooper's hawks are about crow sized <clears throat> and uh, the males can be a little bit bigger. The females can be a little bit larger than a crow, but it kind of gives you an idea how big they are. So here's the backside. Again, a brown bird with streaks. And so I mentioned that there's an, another one. Uh, it's called the sharp shinned hawk. And believe it or not, these little guys are only about as big as a blue jay, a little bit bigger. Some uh, females are more like a pigeon, but that's not a very big hawk. And yet uh, there's a lot of little songbirds out in the world, so there's plenty of food for them to eat. So this is an adult, similar to the Cooper's hawk, it's this slaty gray or bluish gray on the back. And it, again, it's got this orangey brown coloration underneath. And just like the other hawks, here's an immature and it's streaked underneath and they're brown on the back. So again, you could uh, people spend a lot of time trying to tell the two apart when they see them. Sometimes it's not always possible, but and I won't go into that because that would be a whole other talk. But now you know they're around, they're in the area. Sharp shinned hawks are here in the fall, winter. They don't breed in the Piedmont so much, or if they do, it's pretty rare. But we do get Cooper's hawks now that breed all around the Piedmont in North Carolina. And again, they eat birds, so they come to your bird feeder. And that's not always fun to, to witness, but you know, a bird is a bird. So, and everybody's got to eat. So there they are. <clears throat> and there's a Cooper's hawk eating a starling in downtown Raleigh. So we get some falcons too. <clears throat> there are three species in the east, and I'm just gonna show two because these are birds that will nest in very urban downtown areas. The peregrine falcon is one of the most uh, known birds because it 
has the uh, you, you can fly over 200 miles an hour when they're diving, and that's, so they're well known, and they've been used in falconry a lot. Uh, they were extirpated from the lower 48 years ago from DDT, but different wildlife agencies have done uh, captive breeding programs and reintroduced them. And now, for example, in North Carolina, we have 11 pairs that breed out in the mountains. It's a bird that in the tundra, where they're really common up in the Arctic, they breed on uh, cliff faces. And when they get to urban areas with big buildings that have brick, you know, uh, windowsills and such, they're like, oh, well, that looks like a, a rock ledge. So, and there are all these pigeons and doves and other birds around. So they, they, they have plenty of food. And so they're starting to set up shop in different places like New York, Chicago, and uh, even Charlotte, I think, had a nesting pair. So this is an adult. The, the young are just like the others. They're brown on the back with streaks underneath. But this is an, an adult bird. that was hanging around in downtown Raleigh last winter. And in fact, I mentioned how the red tails were hanging around. And this peregrine had apparently had a mate. They were hanging around for uh, in March and April. But but the pandemic hit. And so we, we couldn't go down and keep track of the peregrines, which was too bad. If they nested or tried to, it would have been the first time ever in Raleigh. But um, Jordan was able to get a picture of this peregrine driving this red tail off of its one of its favorite perching sites, which was at the Wells Fargo uh, Bank building. And they, they may come. They may be back this year. I, I really need to go down and, and take a look. <clears throat> so the um, other one that we get in across North Carolina in rural places, but also in urban places is one called the American Kestrel. And it's a very dainty little falcon. They're about the size of a robin or blue, blue jay, and they will often nest in buildings. It's a cavity nester. So it's, again, it's another, another one of these birds that's in cavities. And here on your right, you see a bird flying away. It just flew out of this uh, pipe that was, it's in the county courthouse down in downtown Raleigh. And this is one of the little babies that came out later. So this is the male. They have the blue gray on the wings and on the crown. When we look at them in flight, Again, a male on the left with that blue gray. Here's a female with the just all rufous color on the back and another uh, family of three babies that was in the uh, Department of Ag building years ago. They raised uh, three young. It's the smallest uh, North American falcon. So I'm gonna switch over to owls. <clears throat> it turns out that so it's another raptor, more nocturnal, that you can see, you could see up to nine species of owls in North Carolina. Uh, but three of them are re what I would call regular, and they're found across the they're statewide. And the smallest one that we regularly see is not the smallest owl that we see. There are two other species you could see that are smaller, but the smallest one that we would regularly see is the scree the eastern screech owl. And they come in two color forms. There's a gray one, and then there's this uh, what they call the red phase. And again, it's not really red so much as a orangey brown coloration. And um, if and sometimes they uh, co-occur and they will mate together. But there's been some studies done that uh, shows that the uh, grays are more cold tolerant. There's something about their feathers and physiology that they're a little bit more cold, cold tolerant than the red ones. So they will, um, they will separate out, especially at the edges of their range. You get up north, you get more gray ones. One of the most well-known owls around is the barred owl. People know it by its call. It's the one that does the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And it also is is out during the day a lot, and it will call during the day. They also nest in cavities. Uh, the screech owl is also a cavity nester, um, but and the barred owl is. And in fact, there was a fellow in Charlotte that uh, studied them for a while at UNC Charlotte and put up a bunch of boxes. He had about a dozen barred owls using his boxes throughout the throughout Mecklenburg County, but mo a lot of them were in Charlotte proper. Now, they prefer a wetter area. They also feed on reptiles, amphibians, but they feed on a lot of other things like arthropods and, and crayfish and things like that. Um, to me, they're one of the most confiding owls. It, it's To me, it's easy to walk up onto one, take a photo, say hello to it. They're, they're just far more confiding than the others. And here's a, here's a daytime picture, uh, one of my colleagues. Earla took this picture up in North Raleigh, just on one of her walks. If you're going to see an owl during the daytime, uh, most likely it's going to be a barred owl. They have uh, the brown eyes of the other owls, that we see, the screech owl, the horned owl, and some of the others have, have the yellow eyes, whereas the, barn owl, uh, the barred owl has brown. The barn owl also has brown, but we rarely see those. They're here, but not here in Wake County, but they're in North Carolina, but they're rarely seen. And then the great horned owl is the other one that we could see, and it's the big one. It's the biggest one. It's a pretty big owl, and <clears throat> two feet, two feet, a little over two feet if you're a female. It's one of the strongest owls. They will eat a little bit of everything, including 
They'll eat skunk if they can get one. They'll eat other owls if they catch one. Um, they eat rabbits. Um, they're quite voracious. It has a very deep hoot. So um, they do their courtship. They begin around in our area in, in the central Piedmont in late September. You'll hear them courting. Once uh, once a male get, uh, attracts a female, she will join him in, in a duet. And her sound is a little bit higher pitched. So if you're out in an October night and you hear two owls going back and forth and one seems a little bit higher pitched, it's, um, it's a pair. Um, here's an adult that a neighbor of mine found. He's just about a half a mile away from me, uh, closer to Lake Raleigh and Lake Johnson. And then he also found one of its babies uh, just a, a week or so later. And it was very close to his, uh, his backyard. Pretty neat. If you can't find an owl, <clears throat> one thing you can do is you can listen for crows going crazy. When crows find a hawk or an owl, they don't like it, and they they start making some pretty intense calls, and it attracts other crows, and then they will go and harass the owl or the hawk and drive it off. So um, sometimes you can you can find a raptor that way in in an area. Just just follow the crows. And speaking of crows, we now have two. So I'll switch, switch out of raptors and switch over. Uh, we have two flavors of crows, as I say, in our area. We have the American crow and the fish crow. Um, they're pretty hard to tell apart. Uh, we used to only have American crows. About 20 years ago, we started seeing more and more fish crows in from the coast. It's more of a coastal bird. Um, and they're the ones that make this uh-uh, uh-uh sound that uh, a lot of people find it pretty annoying, especially starting in a, in a couple of weeks. You're going to hear a lot of them. They they return, they seem to do this little migration back to the coast, and then they come back about this time in mid-February. And then through the end of February into early March, a lot of them will be staking out their territories again and flying around chasing each other, uttering this uh-uh, uh-uh all the time. Um, but it's hard, otherwise, they're pretty similar in size. The fish crows are just a little smaller, and they're hard to tell apart. One thing that's interesting is that <clears throat> in the past, like, say, 10 years, a couple of pairs of ravens have shown, we think it's two pairs, have shown up in Wake County. Ravens breed in our mountains, and they, like the peregrine, they like to breed on a, on a cliff ledge, on a rocky ledge. So when you come to cities, where do you find it? They don't like buildings. So what else do they have? Well, they have access to quarries. So we have, you know, a couple of quarries over by the airport, over by uh, Umstead Park here in Wake County. And um, that's where at least one pair of ravens has been seen hanging out a lot. It's over by the quarry. So they're probably nesting there. Be interesting to see if um, we get more than just a couple of pairs. It's definitely more of a boreal bird or a lot more common up north, but that's what the mountains are like. Our high elevation mountains are like a boreal forest. So no surprise they're out there, but it is a surprise that they're now as far east as Raleigh. So I switch to woodpeckers. <clears throat> And it's, um, I find it fascinating that I have, I can see up to six species in my yard. Probably the most common, there are two that are really common. I'll do this first. And one of those two is the downy woodpecker. It's the smallest. And the male and female look almost identical, the you know, black and white pattern. But the male has this little red patch on the back of the head. <clears throat> There's a related species called the hairy woodpecker. They're around, but they're pretty rare. They seldom come into our yards or at, at our suet feeder. They're, they're just not as friendly. And so I, I don't bother to show you can those you can look them up online, but the the downies are gonna are the ones you're most likely to see. And we get a lot of calls when people see a little bit of red on the head and black and white. They think it's a red cockaded woodpecker. That's the uh, threatened species, federally threatened. And they're in the Longleaf Pine. They're down in the sand hills, the coastal plain. You can look those up online as well. We don't really get those around here but it is confusing. The red cockade on a red cockade woodpecker is on the side of the head here. This is the other really common one. It is abundant in, in urban areas <clears throat> and all through the Piedmont and the coastal plain. It's called red belly woodpecker. And people say, red belly, what? Because it looks like a red head. It's actually, you know, but it's the, the cap here is red, all red on the male and female has this gray fore crown. And where it gets its name is, in fact, it has a belly with a little red patch on it. There is a red-headed woodpecker, and I'll show you. And it's it's different for having a, the head entirely red, and also the back is different. This has got a zebra back, the black and white zebra pattern, I call it. Whereas the red-headed woodpecker, like this, 
to me, it looks like the sort of shoes that my sister used to wear when we were growing up, which was uh, a long time ago, um, <clears throat> saddle shoes. Um, and then the, the head is entirely red on the adults. Uh, on, a, on a young woodpecker, they, if, if, there's, if there's red involved, it's not, it's not on the young ones for a few months. They come out of the nest and they, it, it look like this. Red bellies also have a, a gray head when they come out of the nest. It takes them four or five months before they undergo their first molt. And then they'll look like this. So redheads are around the Piedmont. They're not as quite as common in the Piedmont as they are in the Sandhills or the Coastal Plain. <clears throat> and um, and in Wake County, for example, they're here, but they're they're spotty and they don't seem to like stay. There were there was a pair nesting on um, just a few blocks away, right across from Powell Park one year, but um, a lightning storm came and a thunderstorm came and knocked their their nest snag over. And then they left. They didn't come back. And then, and then a couple of years later, a, a pair showed up nearby, but they um, they only stayed one season and didn't come back. So interesting. They're a little bit more finicky, and I'll show you why in a in a couple of slides. I'll come back to that. Um, but interesting. Uh, some of the woodpeckers are migratory. There are three species in our area that are migratory. The red-headed woodpecker is one of them. So we get an influx of birds from the north in the fall. They'll hang out in the winter, and then pretty soon they'll head back north. So another migratory one is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's actually the name of it. And we get them here in the fall and winters as well. And then they will head back north beginning uh, about mid-March. They will start heading out of here. You, you probably, you, if, if you don't know the sapsucker by its plumage, you know it by the holes in the trees that you've seen around town. So it looks like somebody took a machine gun to the tree. Um, <clears throat> they drill these specifically to get a sap to flow, and then they lick the sap. They have a modified tongue. It looks like a bottle brush. So that increases surface area so that when they lick the sap, they're getting more uh, liquid per lick. Yeah, some insects are attracted to it. People used to think that's why they did this, but it's not. They're actually, they're like me, um, always after something with sugar in it. And uh, they, uh, and when they, and they eat a lot of fruit as well. A lot of these woodpeckers will eat fruit in the fall and the winter. A sapsucker will eat fruit all year round. So they, um, like some of the other birds, they come in different plumages. In this case, it can be it can be four different types of sap suckers, if you will, or four flavors. Again, this is an adult male. They have this this pretty clean cut plumage. They have the red on the throat and the and the head. And some birds, some populations have more yellow in the belly. This one's pretty pale, but some are more yellow, like this one. Um, this is an adult female. Has a white throat. Still has the red here. Still black and white. And then the young ones have all this checkering underneath and they don't have much red on them. And if it's, this were, looks like a young male, he's got just a little bit of red in the throat. He's got some red in the crown where the young female would just have red in the crown. So um, this time of year, they're all starting to show whether they're boys or girls, but in the fall, uh, we, get, we get these four different kinds that we can tell by their plumage. The other one <clears throat> that both nests here and is uh, and where we get northern ones, migratory ones, is the northern flicker. It used to be called a yellow shafted flicker because there's a bird out west, that, uh, the red shafted. Um, they interbreed, so people decided they're one species and we'll call them northern flickers. Um, other people call them yellowhammer. It's the uh, state bird for Alabama. <clears throat> this bird feeds on ants primarily, so they're on the ground a lot. And unfortunately, that means they get hit by cars a lot. This bird is is a 12. 10 to 12 inch size bird. It's pretty big woodpecker. But they do come to feeders. As you can see, they love suet. So I, I have a couple of them right now coming and going every day out back. And it's beautiful because you can see the yellow under the tail. And you can just see why I call it yellow shafted. And not only do the shafts have yellow, but parts of the flight feathers, like just part of the vein <clears throat> has some yellow. So when this bird flies and you see the yellow in the wings and yellow in the tail, it's really pretty dramatic as it's whether it's flying away or flying toward you. Beautiful, beautiful bird. And there's one on the ground in my backyard with a, it's a, a female and a young. And this stump had some ants and termites in it. And so they were, they were doing their job, helping me out, getting rid of them. The biggest woodpecker we see around here is the woody woodpecker. So it's a pileated and that's an adult on the left. And these are some young ones on the right. <clears throat> they specialize on carpenter ants and termites. And that's, I mean, that's great that they're eating termites. It's not so great if they show up on your house. You know, every now and then we get calls from the mountains. We got this bird and it's this big woodpecker hammering on our house. What can I do? 
I'm like, well, the first thing you got to do is find out if you have termites, because chances are the bird is there because you have termites in your house. So it's kind of a good news, bad news. Um, but you'll see them on on logs on the ground feeding because those those logs often have the carpenter ants or the termites in them. And if you have places with just enough forest cover, it doesn't have to be 100 percent. Um, studies have shown it's just something like you get 60, 70 percent forest cover in, say, a given area. Say you take five square miles like we have around here. Um, if you've got enough forest, then they're they're OK with that. They're OK in urban areas. So, for example, there's a couple of pairs over at Lake Johnson. We see them all along Walnut Creek. Of course, along the Noose River, there aren't many people out there, a lot of farmland. But Wal Walnut Creek is right through some of the most urban areas in Raleigh. But there's just enough forest cover in different patches. And these birds are OK. In fact, I took a picture. These are two siblings, young bird. The, um, the adult was nearby. And I took this picture down on uh, Walnut Creek a couple of years ago, right near one of the busiest roads uh, that, that transects. The, the greenway. And here's one that showed up in my neighbor's yard just a couple of weeks ago. She texted me to say there was one in her backyard and I'd only seen one. I live about a mile from Lake Johnson. I'd only seen one once. So I was pretty excited and I uh, got my camera. I just stayed in my backyard and, and uh, after about five minutes, we found the bird. I was able to get a photo, but just to show you that even with a, a, a cheap little point and shoot camera, it was fun to see the bird and get a photograph and and there's that uh like i tell you a dead wood this bird had found the dead wood and all that chopped wood right there that's what she it's a female i can see the gray foreground um she knocked off all that bark she was looking for those ants and any termites um this is what i meant about the red-headed woodpeckers a little bit picky so on the left here is where red belly woodpeckers have nested in my neighbor's yard for years you can see the holes here this is an old maple tree and the snags, a couple dead snags. And so the red bellies are happily making cavities year after year. The red headed like cavities, but they like a cat. They like a trunk or a branch that no longer has the bark on it. So here's where the birds were hanging out. Um, actually, it was this one a couple of years ago, just up the street. Uh, the a pair uh, used this tree to to nest with just one, but just one year they didn't come back. But this is another tree that was used by some other ones um, in a different location. So so if you can tolerate, I'm going to go back to whoops, back to that. If you can tolerate having these snags around your yard or, or property, then it's great for different cavity nesting birds. And the woodpeckers are the primary excavators. They don't reuse their cavity. They build another one. Uh, but somebody else will come in later, for example, the nut hatches great crested flycatcher, even bluebird. Bluebird is a cavity n nester and in, in, in natural setting, they would use a cavity like this. So you can, or you get flying squirrels using these or little white footed mice. So there's a lot of other little animals that will come in afterwards and use these cavities. So if you can tolerate them, if it's not a hazard, then it's great to have them around. And another uh, cavity nesting inhabiting bird is the chimney swift. Historically, it was called the tree swift because that's what it occupied were big, dead, hollow trees, which we don't find much anymore in the east. So they adopted chimneys <clears throat> about 500 years ago. It's an aerial insectivore. You may have uh, seen them flying around and thought they were bats in the daytime. They kind of look like that, but they're not in the daytime. Uh, people call them a cigar with wings, uh, pudgy little bodies, very fast flyer, and they, pretty, they do pretty much everything on the wing. <clears throat> um, they roost in big flocks in the fall and they use big chimneys. So for, in, for instance, uh, we've uh, I've volunteered with Wake Audubon for years and we have a chimney swift program and for years we've done watches downtown. In September, we would go out on, on every Sunday in September and go to one of the chimneys that's hosting a big flock of swifts and we watch them uh, swirl around and go and this, this particular chimney, I was able to get up on top of the roof top of the building uh, adjoining it and get some photos and video but um at the time there were three or four thousand birds swirling around and that's often how it goes so wake audubon uh worked with the museum of natural sciences and my employer and we did some fundraising so that we could build a chimney out at the prairie ridge eco station property we've not had a flock of birds use the chimney in the fall in part because there are other chimneys like over here at the national guard property there's already several chimneys and they just keep going back to the same ones. But every year a pair does nest here and 
raises some some babies. Um, we've done things like bird of the year, chimney swift. We planted a native plant garden here to go along with this area, but um, we're hoping that at some point a flock will uh, take up residence during fall migration on their way south. So this is a migratory bird heading to South America, and uh, then we'll be able to do programs just to watch the chimney swifts out here. But otherwise, if you get a chance to you know, visit, say, um, schools have are still hosting some. This year I did a program over at Daniels Middle School. I was able to go and do a remote program and broadcast it. Um, they had, uh, boy, when I did it in September, it was the 22nd or so, they had, we probably had 3,000 birds roosting that night. Um, some pretty cool videos are online, including the, mu the museum ones that, that we got. Um, we don't know exactly what it does down in uh, South America. It's kind of an interesting bird. Um, we know they winter some in northeast Peru and western Brazil, but not. Uh, we don't know very much about it and what it does. And the biologists down there aren't sure either. And part of the problem is that there are several species in that area that are that are resident all year round in Peru and Brazil, and they look a lot like a chimney swift. So sometimes they just can't tell them apart. This is what it looks like inside a, a chimney with a nest. Here's how the birds line up when they're roosting in the fall. <clears throat> they just all along the, the mortar, the brick line, they just line up. And the nest is this uh, stick nest that the female glues the sticks to the side of the chimney. So it's a, it's a half circle and then she lays the eggs inside. I was going to put a video in here, but I think 100 megabytes. I guess I could show it at the end if we wanted to see it, but it really was, uh, there was a lot of, that was a lot of space, so omitted it for now. <clears throat> um, the birds that are called swallows are, uh, people, when people see chimney swift, they often think of swallow, think they're related. They're not actually, chimney swift is related to hummingbirds, but they do a lot of the same things in that they forage on the wing, they're aerial insectivores. And so we have several swallows around our area, and uh, they're migratory. Mo uh, many of them nest in cavities, not all of them, but the, one of the most popular ones is the purple martin. This is a male. Um, uh, with, you can see the back coloration and why it's called purple martin. And this is a, a female, and this is obviously a young one. <clears throat> um, well, maybe not obvious, but it's a young one that I'm holding. We do a little bit of, we tag some of the young ones that nest at, our, uh, at two sites that we manage two breeding sites. So how do we do that? Uh, purple martins are, are historically nested in small clusters, but again, a lot of these big dead trees, they just don't make big dead trees anymore. People tend to cut them down. And so uh, years ago, people figured out that, a long time ago actually, figured out that you could put up little gourds, little birdhouses for them, and they would come in like this, and then people figured out that you could put in big groups of them, like a, you know, a dozen or more, and just have a big, big a group of purple martins. So here at the site that is run by the faculty club over off Hillsborough Street by the vet school, NC State Vet School, there's, um, I think there are 60 pairs of purple martins. There's several clusters of housing, we call it affordable housing. So over Prairie Ridge, we have this, and now we have a, 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 a one of these. Uh, at our Prairie Ridge site. So again, Wake Audubon helped fund uh, uh, one of these to go over at Prairie Ridge. And uh, this woman here <clears throat> is Courtney and she m monitors a bunch of these colonies around Wake County. But it's one of the projects we do, uh, the museum and Wake Audubon does to just promote Purple Martins. This is kind of a cool map and I'm gonna see if it works. So this is a migration in, in action map, it's another resource that I provide at the end. You can go to eBird and look stuff up. You don't have to have an account. You can have an account and you can report. I'm sure some of you do. You can report stuff from your yard. It can be any kind of a reporting you want, or you can explore the data. There's um, <clears throat> there are different things now that they offer. And one of them is these animated maps from all the data, all this crowdsourced data. So watch this, this is, uh, so it's starting in January, February, March. So around here, Martins show up in the uh, Raleigh area around the first week of March. Um, they depart by August or so. So you'll see this, this clump of birds moving up and then moving back south, if it works. It looks like it's working. All right, so now it's summertime <clears throat> and now it's fall and they're heading to South America. This is where they winter and 
Venezuela and Brazil. So it's pretty cool. They got uh, they got over 100 species now that they've animated the data. It's pretty neat. You can slow it down, or you can look at a given month and see uh, a number of species now where they've got this pretty cool data. It's a pretty neat site. Um, one of the other common ones around here that is also pretty pretty adapted to urban lifestyles is uh, the barn swallow. And so yes, they will nest in barns. They're very fond of nesting in, a, in any open barn. They will they build an open cup nest out of mud, but they will nest under bridges. Every bridge in North Carolina has the barn swallows underneath it, and they're colonial nesting, so it can be anywhere from a few pairs to 20 or 30 pairs. Um, and they'll nest on certain in some people's porches, especially in slightly more rural places. They so get to the uh, edge of town or further out in the county. Um, a number of people have reported to me that they get barn swallows right on their front porch, a nesting on the banister or on the light, the light post and that sort of thing. They got the forked tail, great flying bird, super in flight. Um, this really rich color underneath of russet and chestnut and tawny, and then this this uh, iridescent color in the back instead of being purple like the purple martin. This is a a real steely dark blue, They're really dramatic. And so here's, uh, here's what I mean by an open cup mud nest. <clears throat> and this is uh, underneath somebody's porch. Um, and here's one just, just sitting on the porch railing. So <clears throat> a small group of birds that, that we get mostly in migration, whether spring or fall, that's a group called warblers, especially in the Piedmont. We have a few nesting ones, but we have many more that come through in the fall. There's some 40 species. And there's obviously no way to talk about them all, but I'd love to show some of the diversity that you might see, you know, any given time. And and these are things in my backyard. For example, this one called a magnolia warbler in the backyard a couple of years ago. This pine warbler does nest here. They stay here all year round. And they do like the pines a lot. So it's a good name for it. These guys, um, unfortunately, this one hit one of our house windows. I just came out one morning and there it was. I'd never even seen them in our neighborhood, um, but there it was called a palm warbler. And then um, I went looking later on that day and found a little flock of them down the street. This one's over here is called black throated green. And this one's called K May. All of these can be uh, in our yards. This is one of the most common ones we see around here. They starting in the fall through the winter into spring. It's the yellow rump warbler. And similar to the sap sucker, where you can have adult male and female, young male, young female, these guys uh, come in these different varieties. But this is an adult male here. So in the sun come March and April, they start. They, the males look like this, and it's pretty pretty dramatic. Otherwise, they're going to look something like this, whether it's a winter male or winter female or a young bird like this. But they happily come to suet. They're at my suet feeder. I have a dozen of them out there right now fighting over the suet along with the pine warbler. The pine warbler likes suet as well. Um, we get these guys that will come in our yards. It's called black and white warbler. This is a, a female. The males have a black throat and a little bit more black streaking. <clears throat> but they um, they are fairly regular through. They actually nest in the Piedmont, but they won't nest in our yards or anything. They're out in the forest, but they will migrate through our yards. And, uh, and then this is one called a common yellow throat. They like to be in big open meadows for nesting, but every year I get one or two in my uh, in my backyard, migrating through. And uh, one of the most acrobatic ones you'll see around is the American Red Start, and it's not really red, obviously it's orange, but um, there you go. And this is the male, and this is what a female looks like. And it is a very, very animated little songbird. These guys are just about four and a half inches long. But the red start is one of the most hyperactive ones you'll see. They they do a lot of flitting about and fly catching. So they they will flush insects out of the trees when they're foraging and then fly after them. So typically it's going to be lace wings or small moths, uh, things that are that that yeah that, that, that they flush that are flying away. And then they'll spiral down. They may have to chase that thing 20 feet down. I've I've had them l practically land at my feet while they're chasing these bugs. And so they're really, they're really fun to watch just because they're so acrobatic and they're often tipping upside down like this and spreading their tail and spread their wings. So once you, once you see one, you really can't, can't miss it. They're not all <clears throat> colorful. Um, 
And I'll, I'll show one other warbler that's not. Uh, it, there's one in the next slide that looks a lot like these guys, which are uh, kinglets. These are tiny little things. They're about three and a half inches long. They, don't, they weigh uh, about six grams. And one is called the golden crown kinglet, and one, this one is ruby crown, and it gets its name where the males have this little red patch on the, on the crown. <clears throat> this is a female. I don't see these so much in my yard. They like to be in the taller pines, typically, to, uh, conifers. Um, I see them in the neighborhood sometimes. But especially I see them over at like Lake Johnson or Lake Raleigh where there's a lot more conifer at Umstead Park, those kinds of places. But ruby crown kinglets all over urban areas because they like the shrubbery. So they're down low and they will come to your suet feeder. And so they're, um, they're more likely to be seen in our yards. And sometimes they will uh, even come to my hummingbird feeder. So I said they like suet, but here's a shot of one. This is one at my hummingbird feeder, which I have up right now because sometimes we get hummingbirds in the winter and they're odd species from out west. So um, anyway, I don't have a hummingbird, but I do have a kinglet that comes in and gets some food. And this bird on the left is just, it's pretty rare in, uh, in our area. It's called orange crown warbler, believe it or not. You can just see it's got a little hint of orange here. And uh, one of my colleagues in North Raleigh just has got one at her feeder right now. I couldn't believe it. So it's pretty exciting. But you can see it looks a lot like a ruby crown kinglet. But um, Anyway, she got she and her husband got some great photos of this bird coming to the feeder. Every now and then they, they show up in our yards. Every now and then they'll again, like in her case, they come to the suet feeder. You never know. And there are more. There's some species of warblers I haven't shown you. There are more around uh, the Piedmont area that come through. <clears throat> Another group of birds that we see coming through, and also some nesting, are thrushes. And in this um, in this case, robin and bluebird are a thrush. So this is a a family of birds worldwide. And so in our area, we in North Carolina, for example, we have uh, six or seven, <clears throat> maybe eight. I should have counted up. But in my yard, aside from robin and bluebird, I have seen the great cheek, the Swainsons, and the hermit thrush. And admittedly, they look pretty similar. But it's just kind of cool to know that, that they're around. These two migrate south, uh, head to... Caribbean islands or Central or uh, America or South America, these guys migrate into the Southeast. So they actually will stick around here um, all winter long. And this is a close up of gray cheek thrush just to show you where the name comes from and just kind of how they look. The gray cheek and the Swainson thrush are this olive color on the back spotting underneath. But this guy has a big dark eye and, and, this, and does have this grayish to the face. These guys, uh, head to South America. And they eat a lot of fruit. So, and, the, and then this one, when it's in my yard, will sometimes eat suet. So in the, in the fall, all those birds eat fruit, all those thrushes coming through. And in the, uh, in the winter, when these guys hang around, they will eat a mixture of uh, insects that they can find on the ground and uh, suet at your feeder. They do breed in our mountains. So does uh, another thrush called the viri. But the viri heads to South America as well. And uh, I haven't seen too many viris around my uh, neighborhood, but uh, it's just those other three that I mentioned. I will say a few extra words about a robin because it's one of my favorite birds, even though it's so common. But right now, uh, s folks have been reporting. They're seeing huge flocks, and there are huge flocks, hundreds and hundreds of robins flying over at sunset. Um, a lot of times they will roost up the way a chimney swift does. They will roost up in the late afternoon, early evening, and then spend the night, sleep as a, a, in big flocks, and then disperse during the day to feed. And uh, uh, some of them are probably heading back north already. Robin is you know, an interesting name. It's used for a number of other species. They're not all related. My bad joke there. I have a cousin named Robin. She's related. The robin is, uh, the, our, our robin's name comes from the European robin, which is uh, also has a, a reddish brown underparts. The American robin, uh, of that as a species, there are, well, there are seven what we call subspecies or, or regional variants. And it's, it's got a huge range. You know, the robin breeds all the way from Alaska to, well, and all throughout the, so all throughout Canada and the U.S., and and some breed into Mexico. It's a state bird of Connecticut, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The northern populations are migratory. 
Ours in North Carolina probably hang around. We're not sure. Uh, they're pro- uh, in, in some cases, it seems that birds that breed in North Carolina will migrate a little bit south and then replaced by other birds from the north. We're still trying to tease apart some of that stuff. But um, the robin is extremely nomadic in the fall and in the winter. And these groups move around. That's another reason why people might be seeing these large flocks of, of hundreds and hundreds of birds flying around. But we get an infusion of different kinds of what I call different kinds of robins during the fall and the winter. So you might see birds that look really different from one day to the next because they're different subspecies. They, 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 morphologically, they look a little different. They do eat a lot of worms, but they eat more worms in the spring and summer. And then in the fall and the winter, they consume a lot of fruit. And they will come to my suet feeder. But they especially eat non-native fruit, especially privet. So they spread it around, which is sort of unfortunate, but that's what they do. They can raise up to three broods here in the in the south. Not all are successful, but uh, but if they are, consider the fact that a female might raise up to twelve teenage robins in one season. That's a lot of baby robins. Um, but one cycle is about thirty days, so three to four to build, fifteen day incubation, and a little under two weeks to fledge. And they will start by April, so they got plenty of time to to do several broods. Some other uh, classic urban birds, the northern mockingbird, don't have a lot to say other than here they are, the males and females look alike, and no surprise, they come to, there's one coming to my suet feeder almost every day now. Um, pretty common, whether you're in downtown or even you know out in rural places, um, a delightful little bird to have around, pretty vocal. If there's a full moon out, they will sing, and in urban areas where street lights are on a lot or building lights are on, Mockingbirds will sing all night long. Related to mockingbird is the great catbird. Mockingbird is not a migratory one. The great catbird is migratory. They uh, they don't go very far, but they do but they do migrate. So further toward the Gulf Coast, some go to Caribbean islands, some go to into Mexico. But um, gray is, gray catbird is a good name for it. Both the vocalization is like a cat, and it's a pretty gray bird. If you get to see it from underneath, like here's one at my suet feeder, then it's got this patch underneath and again here's a water bath that attracts a lot of birds so that's just the uh, one way of doing water <clears throat> brown thrasher is also related to uh, mockingbird and another one that comes to the suet um, that's also migratory but we see them here all year round because we get birds from probably from up north and it's a big bird all these birds are um, you know anywhere from like nine to eleven inches this is the largest one um, I've been working with some teens, as I mentioned, and they've helped me with a few bird projects. And I thought I'd I'd mention uh, a couple of them um, because they all worked on on these together. She spearheaded one, and her sister spearheaded another. And uh, she did one that involved Lake Johnson, and I thought that'd be kind of fun to show you. So she wanted to. I asked her to do some looking uh, surveying for brown-headed nuthatch. It's a little. A uh, little songbird, it's the upside down bird. We have three species of nuthatches in our area, white breasted. In the fall, winter, we get red breasted and then brown headed. The uh, white breasted is in hardwood and the brown head is in the pine. It's a tiny little thing. These guys are about four inches long and they will use a nest box. So we've been doing a uh, Wake Audubon, North Carolina. We sponsored a nest box program to get a bunch of them out in people's yards and, uh, and they will come in. So here's some eggs and a couple of recently hatched eggs there, baby nut hatches. So what I had uh, Vanessa do, she went to three locations to do surveys and she did uh, four stations at each spot and she did three counts at each of those four. So she went to Weymouth Woods. They, they were in high school doing this. I thought it was pretty cool. They were spending their early weekend mornings driving around to places like Lake Johnson and Weymouth Woods and they uh, and she, they did the counts together, and this is what they found. So Weymouth Woods has all that longleaf pine, and we figured that was the, the uh, gold standard for nuthatches, and it, that appears to be the case. But she also did Shank Forest, which is a lot of pine over there uh, by Umstead Park, and then Lake Johnson. And it's interesting that so Lake Johnson had um, the next highest number of nuthatches, and Shank Forest had, had the lowest. So she also, they also did a bunch of measuring of, of habitats and vegetation to see what might be going on because we know that the nuthatches like 
they like tall pines and they like little snags. So anyway, what she found, a little bit much here, but I'll just explain it quickly. The point is that Weymouth had the most birds. And what the orange is, is how big around the tree is. So you can see it's, um, this is a hundred centimeter uh, circumference. And, and then the gray is the percentage of pine to hardwood. So it's 95% pine. So that's probably why there's so many, so many birds that, and there's, they leave a bunch of snags. And then Lake Johnson had 50% um, pine, 50% hardwood, but they got some pretty big pine trees over there at Lake Johnson. So these are, uh, this circumference is much larger than the ones that down at Weymouth. So, and they're loblolly pine, they're really big. So they probably have a lot of snags and that's probably why you get as many um, nuthatches as you do. And then shank just, uh, even though they have more pine by percentage, they're smaller pine. So they probably just didn't, um, they don't have enough, they're not old enough to have produced dead snags. So anyway, interesting little project. And there's some more nesting at a nest box. And then this is a, a little mailbox that my neighbor uh, has and the, the top rotted out. So I noticed one day that nuthatches were coming and going and uh, we followed them this past spring and um, they raised uh, four or five babies. This is what it looks like on the end. This is their babies on the inside when uh, they were about uh, about 10 days, uh, no, maybe just like seven days old. And then the other bird they looked at was the Carolina wren. Carolina wrens are one of the most neighborly birds. They're, they're all over our yards, our houses. They specialize in spiders. So when they're hopping around your porches and windowsills, they're looking for spiders to feed on. It's a easy one to catch. We can put these, these bands on, these rings on their feet. We get people to watch them and report sightings and such. But uh, we wanted to know a little bit more about a couple of birds over at the, the Prairie Ridge Eco Station site, and that's what I had Olivia do. It's another one that's going to feed on suet. It's a year-round resident, and this is where they occur. So what we did over at Prairie Ridge was, you know, again, it was just a project for her to get used to doing research and asking questions and collecting data. I have uh, permission to put little transmitters on birds. Little, These things are a little half a gram. And that's a hearing aid battery. It drives a little electron, a little chip that's here. It's, and it's beeping at one frequency. <clears throat> and then we go out with a receiver and an antenna, and you can find the bird from up to about 300 meters away. So, um, you know, not real far, but far enough for a little bird that doesn't go that far. And so we did this over Prairie Ridge. If you've been over there at all, it's, you know, West Raleigh. This is the National Guard. If you were over here on the right side, you'd be at the Art Museum. And this is our property. So this is Edwards Mill Road, and we just, this is our outdoor facility, our outdoor education facility, and we just caught a couple birds in the woods here and tagged them, and this is what she did, we'd go out, they went out on the, on three weekends, and they would just find the bird and then take a GPS reading, it was a male and a female, and so it was just kind of, kind of fun to see how the birds moved around, this is about 200 meters, and it's about 75 meters wide, they did not seem to go across the street at all, probably because there are wrens over here. Uh, there's a pair occupying this woods and there was enough singing going on and, and the bird you know, surely felt no need to go across the road, but it could go over this way. And then it was stopped here by another pair of wrens that was living here. And then there was another pair up here to the north. So they were hemmed in by wrens, but it was kind of fun to see how much moving up and down. It's not very much really for, you know, for a, for a bird, but um, they can fly, but it's all they needed. And related uh, is, a is the house wren, and it gets its name from willingness to uh, occupy boxes. What, what the uh, birds do when they're nesting, the males will build two or three nests. It's a migratory species. They come back in mid-April, and then the male will find places, build two or three partial nests. The female will come along, and she'll pick one and complete it. So if you have that happen, like I have eight boxes in my yard. And when the male does that, the two or three, once the female picks one, then I'll go out and clean out the other two so other birds can, can use it if they want. The Carolina chickadee is the chickadee we get here in the Piedmont. There is a species called black-capped chickadee, and they're very similar, <clears throat> and it can be very confusing, but um, black caps in North Carolina only occur at the really high, high elevation above 5,000 feet, pretty much in the Smoky Mountain region, and we don't get them here all across the state. We get the little, the dainty little Carolina chickadee, and they also use these nest boxes. So what I do, what we uh, encourage, again with the Audubon project with the nuthatch boxes, they have smaller holes than you have on the bluebird side box. So 
So we use a uh, opening that is reduced in size. I don't, yeah, this, so this is a smaller opening. And what it does is it'll, it, it blocks out the other big birds. And there are three species of birds that can get in here. One is the house wren, one is the chickadee, and the other is the brownhead nuthatch. And we just let everybody figure it out. These are the other two nuthatches I mentioned. So white-breasted we get all year round. They're mostly in hardwood. And then red-breasted come in the fall and winter and will come to our feeders and such. <clears throat> if you're fortunate, you might see one of these lovely little birds. There are two species of tanagers. It's a migratory songbird, and uh, in, they, they breed here and then head south in the fall. The male's quite dramatic. The scarlet tanager on the left has the black wings, and it's a hardwood bird. Really, oak and hickory is what they like. I don't see them much around, although I did have this one in the yard once during migration. And then this is the male summer tanager, and these are female summer tanagers. They're a little more flexible. The summer tanagers are in pine and hardwood and more likely to be found in urban areas. Um, and then, not so colorful, we get a variety of sparrows around. I'm just going to show one, which is because one, it's one of the, um, to me, one of the most fun ones, the white-throated sparrow, for several reasons. One, it has a great little song, and they will sing in the middle of winter. If the sun comes out for just a little bit, they will sing. This is a bird that breathes in Canada, mostly, some northern U.S. states as well, but it's really a boreal bird. And then they, they come here in the fall and winter. <clears throat> there are two kinds, again. There's, uh, like other birds, where these two morphs or two flavors. There's this, this black and white, and, and you can see the black coming in as spring goes along. It's going to get blacker and blacker. By March, April, these birds are really dramatic. And then there's this tan, what I call tan and brown, much duller. Up on the breeding grounds, um, they will interbreed. And you could be a male or female and be black or white. You can be male or female and be tan and and white it, it's it's they, they it's a really interesting story you can look it up online some interesting genetics and behavioral stuff but i just love that they're common around here they're so pretty they sing in the winter and these are a couple of birds that we banded in 2018 in my backyard those those same three girls came over they've been working with me for a while they came over in 2018 we banded five white-throated sparrows um two of them came back this year i think it's so neat that they like my little backyard and my bird seed. <clears throat> um, another, it's actually a sparrow. I said I'd show one, but I guess I lied, it's two, because I always forget that the junco, we call it the dark-eyed junco, but it's actually a, a sparrow. And it's pretty common. Also around the Piedmont, around our urban areas, <clears throat> there's a population that breeds in the mountains, but the uh, slaty gray, white underneath, and they have these white outer tail feathers so when they fly off, you see these white outer tail feathers, but they readily come into your yard and any any bird seed. A um, I guess technically these guys are considered a large sparrow. There is a lot of genetic work that goes on these days to understand the relationships of these birds. And I think um, come to think of it, these are sparrow. This is the eastern tohi. It used to be called the rufous sided tohi, but there's a species out west <clears throat> that used to be lumped with this, and then they decided they're two species. So. This became the Eastern Tohi. It's it's here year round. We uh, got its name from one of its call notes, which sounds like it's saying Tohi or Chiwink, but um, it's uh, it's a skittish bird. It also has a song that people like to to have a onomatopoeic thing for it. They say it sounds like it's singing "Drink Your Tea," and the tea is often springy at the end, so it'll be "Drink Your Tea." And uh, you'll hear them singing a lot, but it'd be hard to find the bird. They'd be up in the trees, and then it'll fly away because they're pretty skittish. But they feed on the ground a lot, and they nest in the shrubs. They scratch around in the leaf litter. They're pretty noisy when they're scratching around. They dig up the leaf litter to look for things. And most people see them from behind. So they see the back. They don't see the roof is colored. They don't see the white belly here. They don't see the white. Or if they see the white in the tail, when the bird flies off and it flicks its tail, they'll see some white. And so for years, I would get calls from people that say, I've lived here 25 years and I've never seen this bird. And what's going on? Or is it new? To, is it a new species, the science? And um, and it was just a, an eastern tohi, but they'd never seen it like this before. They finally got to see from the side or the front. And uh, it's a great little bird. The females are brown on the back instead of black. And just so you know, the fledglings, when they come off, they are, um, after about a month of being out of the nest, they will start their first molt. 
And when they molt, if they're if they're a boy, they'll, they'll grow in black feathers. And if they're going to be a girl, they'll end up being brown. But these are two different siblings that are going to be males when they when they grow up. But they look pretty funny when they're molting. They don't look like anything in the field guide. <clears throat> and then to wind up, there are some finches that we get at our uh, at our feeders. And uh, mostly in the winter then, since we're feeding birds fall and in the winter. The purple finch is it's not quite as urban as it used to be. We now have house finches around, and I think it's driven a lot of purple finches off. We tend to see more purple finches now in the rural parts, and when people have them at their feeder, it's it's rural. But this year is a big year. It's a big invasion year. There's a, a up north, the spruce cones did not produce cones this year, and a number of birds like pine siskin, purple finch, red-breasted nuthatch, they've erupted, they've headed south, and they're here. And so I actually have these at my feeder this year, and I haven't seen purple finches at my feeder for five or six years, so it's pretty exciting. They're, they are a, a richer color. You'll see, I'll show you some pictures of the house finch. This is more of what I call a blue-based red, and the house finch is more of a yellow-based red. And also the female has these really bold streaks, this dark cheek patch and, and, the, and the brown and white. Her bill's a little bigger too. But here's a house finch. Um, and you can see it's pretty similar. These guys are a little bit quieter looking, a little duller looking. This guy's pretty bold, but you can see it's really more of a orangey red, not that, not that uh, purpley red. And um, the pattern's a little different. The purple finch has more on the wing. These guys don't. Their bill's a little bit smaller. And they're really variable. The house finch is quite variable. It's a bird of the southwest. It was accidentally introduced in the east, and now it's all up and down the, the eastern states. So here's a really dull male. And like I say, a lot of variation. And then this is what the females look like. You can see it's pretty different from the female purple finch. Much, much quieter looking plumage. But very common at the feeder. They have a wonderful little song. They will nest on your porch. If you leave your uh, wreath out, your Christmas wreath out too long, they will build a nest in it. So will Carolina Wren. If you leave a Boston fern out, either one of those will build a nest in it, which is kind of fun. One of the other finches that we get around is the American goldfinch. So they do stay here all year round. They breed, and then we get a bunch from up north that come in the winter. Um, one of the, uh, I guess you call it a challenge for identifying goldfinches, uh, the male here, this is a breeding male, and this is one of his babies. It's just off the nest for maybe a month and is still uh, attending him and getting some food from him from these sunflowers. But uh, this, is the, this male will molt in the fall, and, and then he will look a lot like this. This is a young male. So this is these birds will when they molt, they'll do a molt and get the sort of half yellow, half brown plumage that they wear for a year and then a, a year later. So like when they're in their third year, there's when the males look like this and then females look like this as well. So it's a little bit uh, confusing, but you can pretty much always tell a goldfinch when you have a goldfinch, no matter what the actual exact plumages are. And they come in some pretty big flocks at times. So I've had up to 15 or 20 at the uh, at the feeder. They like uh, sunflower and they like thistle. So this is sunflower here and this is a thistle feeder here. And I'll show you some more thistle in a second because the other bird that's related to a uh, goldfinch that also likes sunflower and thistle is this thing called the pine siskin. And uh, again, it's usually not around here much in the winters in, in this part of North Carolina, but this is a big year also for them. And uh, one day I had a hundred of these out back which is a lot of siskins to be feeding. And I was actually kind of glad when most of them left and only about a dozen hang, uh, hang around. But really, really a lot of variation too, but they have a little bit of yellow in the wing and tail. Not all of them, but, but like this one's white, but um, a lot of them do, so they're really dainty. But here's, here's a typical thistle feeder. So the, uh, the siskins and goldfinches both are, are fond of hanging upside down when they feed. That's just part of their natural behavior. So you can, you can buy feeders I have a sock, I have this metal one, and the other feeder has holes in it, and the perch is above the hole, and so the, the finches know what to do. The siskin and the goldfinch know how to hang upside down. Um, it's really fun, but if it's sunflower, they'll just feed like this. And uh, one of the most dramatic uh, birds, it's actually related to cardinal, is the rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, it's a migrant in the Piedmont. They do breed in our mountains, but they will come in the spring and in the fall, and they'll come to the sunflower feeder, and it's great. So this is a spring bird at my feeder. Um, 
spring bird at one of my uh, colleagues' feeder, and this is a female that was at my feeder. In the fall, the males molt, and they look a lot like the, a female, except they'll have a little bit of red in the in the chest still, upper, upper breast region, and uh, maybe some black on the wings. Uh, it's a really dramatic bird. It's a really big bill. Can't, can't mistake it when you see it. And the um, another really fine bird that we get, especially in the fall and winter, is the cedar waxwing. It's another migrant around here. Gets its name from right here. And uh, these are adults. Uh, I've seen up to 300 on our street recently because they're also fond of privets like the uh, like the robins are. And um, but it's this wonderful pastel coloration, yellow tip to the tail, and this crest that's often pretty visible. There is a group of waxwings feeding on a privet. So they can come in some pretty, pretty big flocks. And one of my neighbors is a um, professional artist illustrator, and she had a big flock in her backyard at her water treatment. At they have a, or they have a water a bath in their backyard, and uh, she did a really cool painting not too long ago. And I'm going to wind up with a few water birds. I don't say as much about water bird because they're pretty easy to get out there and find and uh, identify. But we get a few, we get four or five different herons around here. These are two of the most common. The left one is a green heron. It's a small one, and on the right is the big great blue heron, which you know stands uh, five feet tall. Pretty pretty big bird, but it's amazing how uh, adapted they are to uh, being around urban areas. They're not, they're not that shy, really. I'm actually, I, I don't think it's, it's not this one, but um, I got a good shot of one just over at the little pond at Palpar. Palpar has this tiny little pond, and I was over there this summer meeting some of the staff to uh, uh, talk about a little garden plot I do, and a little green heron was hanging around at the edge of the pond. Buffleheads come to our lakes, and it's a diver. They dive to feed. They they like to get a little deeper in the water. So if you got some deep water, like you do at Lake Raleigh, Lake Johnson, and um, Lake Wheeler, all those lakes, you can find buffleheads. It's a small. This is a small duck. This is the male, and this is the female. And then on the left is another diver called merganser. This is the hood of merganser, and these are two males and a female. When the, when the male elevates his crest, this is big white patch. And on the side here, it's a pretty dull chestnutty color. In the right light, it can be a little brighter. It can be a little bit more like the shoveler, but uh, for the most part, it, it's pretty dull. But they're around in the fall and winter. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's surprising to me. Again, it's a diver, but it's surprising to me that they will show up in some of the smallest patches of the water, like over at Powell. And the little pond at Powell Park, I, I just saw four birds over there. There were two pairs over there just a week ago. And it just surprised me that uh, that they would be there and, and hanging out. And on the right are what we call puddle ducks. They don't dive. They tip up. They will tip up, and and their little, little hind ends will be sticking up in the air, and their heads are in the water, and they use their bill to sift mud, water, vegetation, looking for the things that they eat. And here are three species. It's kind of fun. This is a black duck, the American black duck. These are northern shoveler males, and this is a northern pintail male. You can see where it gets its name from. It's really kind of fun. And these are just across the street. I, I live in front of this small, it's just a like a five-acre lake silting in quite a bit now, and, um, and these birds will show up every now and then. One of the, uh, I think I'll end with this one because it's the most beautiful, um, one beautiful duck around, I guess you could say. This is a male wood duck. And again, this is a bird that was nearly wiped out, and then people rallied. The hunters rallied with conservation groups, with wildlife agencies. They put a lot of money into it, into managing and, and putting limits on what was being hunted, and the bird really rebounded, and now we have a lot of wood ducks around. It's another great conservation success story. And you see them all around town, too, in certain places, like up and down Walnut Creek, over on the Noose, um, it's really, really great to, to see how they will uh, adapt. And it's a cavity nester. I, sh I forgot to put it on my very first slide there. 
this is a cavity nester, so you can put out boxes, which we have. Wake Audubon has sponsored some nest duck boxes and place them out in different places. And these birds, that's what they'll that's what they'll use. Now in the wild, they would rely on a pileated woodpecker cavity to once that pileated is done, a wood duck will will move in. But you can put up a, a box, a big box with a big hole in the right spot, <clears throat> and you'll get wood ducks coming in. So that's another another neat thing. So I think that's really it. Again, I have these resources that I sent a PDF, and um, probably you could, I guess you could take a screenshot. But um, I was going to show three different uh, slides, like eBird. Merlin is an ID app, and it's free. You can put it on your smartphone. It's pretty cool. It's kind of an artificial intelligence thing. It only it'll ask you like four questions. One of which it needs to know where you are. But based on just like four questions it narrows it down to three or four species from, you know, from what you tell it. It's pretty cool. Audubon has an app. Um, I mentioned the red tail hawk uh, website. Um, these are some sites you can investigate. So I mentioned the eBird with the animated migration. Cornell also does this bird cast where you can look at radar bird migration stuff. People use it live to predict when birds are migrating. You can see these flocks of birds moving on BirdCast site, and you can actually decide whether you're gonna go bird watching the next day or not. Um, Journey Norb, most of you probably know, but if you don't, you can check it out for things like Purple Martin or Ruby Throated Hummingbird, also the Monarch and Sea Turtle stuff. I got the Turkey Vulture maps off Move Bank. Again, you can go and see things, and Purple Martin Conservation Association has their website stuff, and you can participate. Uh, they Every year they, um, ask people to submit their first sighting, the very first sighting that you see. Um, it's pretty neat to look at the map that is generated as the birds are migrating north day by day. Um, if you really want to get into it, then you can join Wake Audubon. You don't have to join, join Wake Audubon. Our programs are public. They're listed online. You can go to wakeaudubon.org and you're welcome to be a member. You do not have to be a member to participate in our programs. We do evening programs. There's one tomorrow night. And uh, it's online, of course, but um, when a, not a pandemic, we get together and we go out and do different things. We do day trips, we do the evening programs. You can, of course, go to, uh, well, a lot of our programs take place at Raleigh Parks. Uh, we do a lot of outreach and native plant sales. I work with youth. I started this youth group. That's where some of them came along to work with me on some projects, but that's open to ages 11 to 18. We hope to resurrect that after the pandemic is over. Um, and it's not just a bird group. It's a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, she's really into herbs, and she's really into chemistry. <laughs> and so uh, she's into, of all things, policy, going into how people write legislation. So, But it's, they're all interested in wildlife. So um, it's, a, it's a group for um, any kind of nature. Coming up this weekend is the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, uh, another project that is done is feeder watch, but if you want to participate in the bird count, you know, you don't have to be a birder or a bird watcher. It's really meant for the public to get involved. You can check out birdcount.org. And uh, what uh, Walnut Creek was trying to host one. I think they still are, and this is their website. Uh, I don't know if they'll be doing it in person or um, with, you know, social distancing or uh, online, but you can read about it here. Theirs is going to be on the 13th. But you can do it in your own backyard if you want to participate. And um, usually our, our parks around here host a great backyard bird count when, when there's not a pandemic going on. So next year, hopefully, you don't know if you're interested, just check out the Raleigh Park site for that kind of uh, stuff going on. And also there's this, again, Project Feeder Watch. They ask people to, to participate at an $18 level because they do a lot of data analysis on that. But again, that's, you know, it's, it's a fun thing for uh kids to get involved with too because you might only have 10 birds 10 species you have to know to submit the data but when you got thousands of people doing it you're crowdsourcing the data so you get some interesting results and and that's it i'm done all right so um we're a bit over time so Darn we'll it. only be taking a couple of questions um john we did have a question uh, at the beginning of the talk you shared those four slides with me with all the information on um these programs that you have going on um they want to know if we can share your presentation today okay okay yeah i can send that to you awesome awesome and um does anybody else have any other burning questions before we wrap up 
You can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. <laughs> All right. I'm not seeing anybody pop up, so um, I'm going to go ahead and just wrap up due to time. But I did want to share we are um, our site is also participating in the great backyard bird count programs. We have some spots available in our programs this weekend, though the weather may not pan out. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Uh, but if you're interested in other sustainable focused programs. We do have our sustainability and art program happening on Wednesday. We're going to be going over invasive vines and making baskets from them. Uh, so there's still space in that program available and um, just keep an eye out. We have Thursday a bonus lecture added. We are uh, planning a prescribed burn here at Lake Johnson Park. So if you're interested in Whoa. learning more about that, uh, please go on the Raleigh NC uh, website and sign up for that program. We'd love to have plenty of people in attendance for that virtual lecture. Um, and next month we'll be having a uh, lecture uh, here. There be dragons, so it's all about dragonflies. So stay tuned for information on that. And um, thank you again. Uh, I would do a say a round of applause, but that's <laughs> not really possible in this format. <laughs> so thank you so much, John. Um, for the lecture this evening and oh, thanks looking forward to getting out there and doing some bird programs with you eventually yeah i think i'll stop sharing now there we go <laughs> <laughs> all right um and again for anybody who missed it if you are getting your ncee certification those will go out via email later on this week so thank you so much for everybody for uh stopping by thanks everyone